Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his most anticipated games for 2020. Before we get to that, Happy New Year everybody. It's a brand new year and a brand new decade, if you can believe it. The 20s are upon us. And you know what? They could not come soon enough. I, for one, am happy to put the 2010s behind us uh, because I am looking forward with hope and optimism about what we might be seeing in the coming years. But today, I'm really going to narrow that hope and optimism and focus on two games because I've got 25 games that I am very, very excited about that should be coming out over the next 12 months. And I'm going to run them down for you, count them down from least to most anticipated for you right now. Although, that's just scratching the surface because when I made this list, I found another 80 or so games that I could have put on here. There's a lot of good stuff in the queue, folks. And if you want to hear about more of it, you can check out the next episode of my podcast, Rotto Talks Through, which... Originally, I was thinking I'd record right after this, but it's getting on towards the end of New Year's Eve, and I just got to get this video done. So we'll save that sometime in the next few days. I'll talk about all the new expansions that are coming and all the games that didn't quite make this top 25. One thing I should say, though, is this top 25 is based entirely on the board game database of Board Game Geek. If Board Game Geek says it's coming in 2020, I have considered it. I know there probably are some games that are coming that aren't in the database yet, and as a result of that, I'm not going to include them. I'm looking at you, Pandemic Legacy 3. Fingers crossed 2020 is the year, but it won't make this list because here we are, as of December 31st, uh, 2019, it does not actually exist in any official capacity. So there's going to be a few games you might expect me to mention that we all are expecting to come, but they won't be here. But in spite of that, there are so many amazeball titles, and I think you guys have waited long enough. Would you like me to start counting down for you? Yes? Then uh, let's get going with my number 25... Return to Dark Tower. Okay, and before I get going in on this, I should say, personally, as a child of the 70s, born in April 1969, I should be the target audience for this game because back in the early 80s, 1981, I think, a game came out called Dark Tower. It was a board game that had a an electronic tower at the center that beeped and booped and made noises. And apparently this game is such a huge part of the childhood of so many board game geeks out there that there is an unprecedented amount of enthusiasm for returning to the Dark Tower at long, long last. Now, I have never played the original Dark Tower. Don't know hardly anything about it. I was more of a... Uh, crossbows and catapults kid myself in the 80s. Uh, but even still, I am keen to see what they come up with because I, you know, I believe Rob Davio, Mr. Legacy himself, is the lead designer on this, but he's got a whole group of guys he's working with, including Isaac Childress, Mr. Gloomhaven. And here's the thing. If the original game had an electronic tower that beeped and booped and did events and whatnot, well, these days with smartphones and whatnot, you better expect that they're going to uh, push it to the next level. And that's what they say they're going to do because this tower, this board game, will be paired with a technological interface unlike any seen before in games, including the titular tower, which holds more than a few secrets. I'll be honest, that in and of itself is intriguing and enticing enough to me because personally, I love the uh, the uh, interplay between digital and analog gaming. And so they're promising to push it in a way that nobody ever has before. So of course, I've got to return to the Dark Tower even if I never went there in the first place. So that's my number 25, Return to Dark Tower. And we've got number 24, Time Stories Revolution. And here I just made reference to A Midsummer Night, which is going to be one of the new chapters of the new saga of Time Stories. And oh man, talk about a shift from the 2010s to the 2020s. Forget everything you know about Time Stories. Uh, at the end of the last decade, the original Time Stories died 
all it has gotten a massive makeover remake that is going to be the second series the blue series or the revolution series and uh midsummer night is one there's going to be at least two other expansions in theory that will come out although that's one change right off the bat none of these are expansions from now on every time stories you buy is a standalone box you don't have to have a central thing that you uh keep plugging other cards into and uh, more importantly the most important evolution of time stories that has me most excited is the fact that they are dropping dice. No more rolling five bajillion dice over and over and over and over again. They've replaced the skill test system with something that is kind of similar, in all honesty, to Gloomhaven. Which, of course, I love, because Gloomhaven is one of my favorite games of all time. And so that is very, very cool. But I think what a lot of people will be excited about is the Groundhog Day nature of the game is no more. From now on, you start a time-traveling adventure where you go into the past and try to make right what once went wrong, and you will do it in one uh, contiguous narrative story. You will not get so far, run out of time, and then have to reset the whole game, and then Groundhog Day try to montage, speed through the stuff you've done. Uh, you will, From start to finish, it'll be a much more standard adventure game. And I imagine for a lot of people, that is music to their ears. Honestly, I love the Groundhog Day system of the previous, so that is one thing that I will mourn, that I will sadly miss, but I don't mind if it's dumping the dice. And so I cannot wait to see more new and exciting chapters of the Time Story Saga moving into the 2020s. And A Midsummer Night will be just one of them. And let's see, that's number 24. Number 23 is Deckscape Duel Pirates Island. I have repeatedly said that Deckscape is my favorite of the Escape Room in Your Home series, and that hasn't changed at all. In fact, I have to admit, we Jen and I have played so many of them now, we're kind of getting burned out, or at least I am getting burned out, on the Exits and the Unlock series. But Deckscape, I will always keep coming back to happily. And... What's really interesting about this new one, Pirate's Island, is that it is competitive. And I don't think this is the first escape room in your home that has tried to introduce this, where players are basically running through separate escape rooms. Are we trying to race? Uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to, you know, to finish it. I think that's very, very cool. Uh, if for no other reason than just to try something new and really shake up the formula. Now, I will feel kind of sad about it because since we play games only two-player, I think that will make arguably the game a little bit weaker because obviously a big part of the joy of escape rooms is solving puzzles with your friends and family and loved ones and all that. And now Jen and I, well, I'm going to be trying to escape mine and you're going to be trying to escape yours. And we probably won't be able to work together. I am kind of bummed about that, but I love Deckscape so much, I'm willing to give it a try. I suspect this will be much better if you have four or six players so that it breaks up into two teams, so you can still have that teamwork feel. But regardless, more Deckscape is a good thing in my book, and them really trying to reinvent the wheel and come up with a new way to experience these games? Sure, sign me up for Deckscape Duel. Pirate Island. Alrighty, then we move on to the next one, which is a Fox in the Forest duet. Now, sadly, I missed uh, the Fox in the Forest, which, as I understand it, is a phenomenal two-player-only trick-taking game. I'm really hoping to get a chance to recover it for the show at some point in the future. But... As interested as I have been in that, I mean, it came out a while ago because I've heard nothing but great things about it. I'm much more interested in Duet because this it re-implements a fox in the forest as a two-player trick-taking game. But what they've done is they have made it cooperative. And a co-op, two-player-only trick-taking game? Oh yeah, baby. I am definitely interested in that. Especially because there was another co-op trick-taking game that came out last year in 2019, The Crew, which I've heard nothing but uh, accolades for. Apparently it's the bee's knees, it's the cat's pajamas. Who knew cooperative trick-taking could be the greatest thing of all time? Right now it's only available in German, so I haven't really sought it out uh, but I am looking forward to a, uh, a cute, adorable little foxes in a forest working together. Yes, please. I mean, I would have been interested in this anyway, but based on just how well-received the crew has been, the idea of cooperative tick-taking, and one that can work for two players, which is rare enough in the trick-taking world, is very, very interesting, which is why it makes the list. But then we move on to Chrono Corsairs. Now, um, actually, I probably... 
I didn't think about this, but I probably should have put this alongside Time Stories because this is another time traveling game. What with the chrono and the big hourglass on the uh, book cover. Here's the interesting thing about this game. Um, if I must mourn the loss of the Groundhog Day nature of Time Stories, hooray, it will be back in Chrono Corsairs because this is a game where a rowdy group of pirates who are out searching for buried treasure on a treasure island and doing all kinds of piratey things, um, they are stuck in a temporal loop, reliving the same day over and over and over again, which means at the end of the round, hopefully you, uh, you've you uh, programmed your uh, uh, pirates because this is like a, a everybody, I think, simultaneously Simultaneously chooses orders and issues the orders at the same time, and then everybody sees what everybody does. Um, at the end of the day, the the board, the island, will reset, and then we'll do it again, knowing a little bit more about what awaits us on the island. I love this idea. I love Groundhog Day. I love the concept of learning more slowly over time, and I love programming games too. And I'm pretty sure that's what this. Yeah, an action cue. So, this game has a lot going for it. I am really intrigued by it. It's from Tasty Minstrel Games, so I fully expect the production will be stellar, and I love all the ideas that are here. I like pirates, especially pirates who aren't out just trying to steal from each other all the time. Fingers crossed there's not too much player versus player here, but I love time travel. I love time loops, so I am super keen on Chrono Corsairs. But we're not done with time travel, folks, because after that comes followers. Now, this is on the list because it is from publisher, the Russian publisher, Cosmodrome Games. And these guys have just been on fire for the last couple of years. Two years ago, they had Smartphone Inc. Last year, they had Aquatica and, oh, the robot game, which I can't think of the name of anymore, but it's from the same designer. Oh, man. But... Uh, long story short, this little publisher that could, coming out of Russia, has really established themselves as a publisher to watch because they just put out phenomenal game after game after game for the last few years. This is their, what so far what they've announced for 2020, looks like it's another big box game, and it is all about time travel. Time travel combined with mythology. So that's right there, very, very intriguing. And as I understand it, a big part of this game has to do with the fact that, oh, when I'm in the past, I make changes that will ripple forward in time. And so uh, the present and the future versions of the game will be affected by what I do in the past. So automatically I'm intrigued by that. And I'm also intrigued by the fact that they promise a unique electronic device to help micromanage the whole process. So that when you're making changes in one time zone, the device will automatically keep track of what's happening in other time zones. I wonder why they're doing a device and not just a smartphone app. I don't know. But if I say, like I said earlier, I love the melding of the digital and the analog. I love time travel. And these days, I think I love Cosmodrome. So followers definitely had to make the list. But if we move on, I think we'll leave time travel uh, behind us for a while and go to Venice. So it's been a while since we've seen a game from Andre Novak. But man, I love this guy's designs. Ever oh, and um, he's teaming up with Dave Turchi. I love his designs as well. So the two of them combining, although for all I know, Dave might only be doing the solo mode, which I think it mentions here. He's doing the solo. So, but I mean, Shavi uh, 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 Boards didn't get mentioned. So regardless, these are two designers. I really enjoy their work. I don't know what brain crack is. Does that mean Andre has now started a new company? Uh, I'll have to look into more of that. But the important thing is, my wife loves Venice. We spent a week there many, many years ago and still have such fond memories. And so this game, which is all about moving your gondolas through the canals, and from the description here, it has kind of a Moncala feel, where as you move, wherever you end up, you activate that space, but you also have the potential to activate spaces as you move, but you don't want to move along the same areas where other players have their gondolas, because then they will gossip about you. It sounds very, very interesting. And like I said, I have been so enamored of so many of Andre's previous designs. Um, you know, uh, Progress and Praetor and, uh, you know, and, and there are a few more that I am so happy to see him returning to the Eurogame sphere and working with Dave, who I don't know, full disclosure, I should say, I do consider a friend. Uh, but that aside, he is also a phenomenal designer as well. So, Venice, I am very stoked for. But if we move on, we get to Tekenu Obelisk of the Sun. 
And so, this is Dave again. And again, I don't know if Dave's just going to be working on the solo version, and this is mostly uh, Daniele Taschini design, but this is effectively the third game in a row, three years in a row, where Daniele has worked with Board and Dice, uh, formerly NSKN, and this is, I think, the capper of what is effectively a dice drafting trilogy from Daniele. First, you had Teotihuacan, then last year you had Trismegistus, and now we have Tekhenu, which again is dice drafting. And this description of the game, you can pause it if you want to read it. I have to admit, I have not even read this. Is so long. There is so much detail here. That's all very, very cool. Other publishers, you could learn a lot from this to try to get people more excited. But honestly, they could have just, you know, they had me at Danielle Tassini dice drafting because the previous two games were fantastic. So I am definitely interested in Tekenu Obelisk of the Sun. Cannot wait to see uh, what he gives us this time drafting those dice because dice drafting is my favorite gameplay mechanism of all time. So woohoo for Tekenu. But then we move on. And we've got Floor Plan. I'm not ashamed to admit, folks, I love roll and writes. The tactile nature of it, the sense of permanence, you know, the fact that when I make a move, well, I can't just, oh, let me, let me just put the other thing over there because I've written and yeah, okay, so I could erase and all that stuff, but there is a gravitas to roll and writes because you feel like you're really making something permanent. You are writing something down. And if you play it with pins like Jen and I normally do, well, there is no undoing those moves. So I love roll and writes to begin with. Um, and I also love the idea of roll and writes that let me be creative. And we've had a few of these now. Um, roll and writes where Hey, what I roll allows me not just to fill in blanks on a spreadsheet piece of paper, but instead to basically make a map. Last year we had cartographers, and before that there was, oh, I can't think of it all of a sudden, uh, you know, Dino World, and there's been a few others as well. Um, but I've had issues with all of them in one way or another, so I'm very excited about this one, Floor Plan from Deepwater Games, the same publisher that brought us Welcome To, which was a hugely popular roll and write, or flip and write, I guess is now the established term. Uh, but this one is all about doing your own architectural layout of a house, making a house floor plan. I like that idea a lot. Because um, I, when I was a kid, I used to make maps on graph paper all the time. And not just of dungeons, but of houses and castles and all kinds of stuff like that. So I love the idea of rolling and riding, but also getting to have a little bit of a creative impetus uh, into the overall development of what I'm trying to build in the game. Very excited about this, in part because of the pedigree of the publisher, but just the uh, core idea of floor plan definitely draws me in. But then we move on to hour of need. I'm very excited about this, folks, for two reasons. One, I love superheroes. Again, I am not ashamed to admit that I've loved them all my life and I love them to this day. Yeah, I cried like a baby at Endgame. Don't at me. But um, I'm always looking for more superheroes and... What the other thing that makes me so excited about this game is, it is from the Sadler brothers, Adam and Brady. And these two guys have definitely established themselves as designers to watch. They have put out a series of games that in previous years, in decades before, would have mostly been Ameritrashy style games, but they have always found ways to build in lots of very cool Euro cool Euro-y mechanisms. And so I've always been impressed by every one of their games they played, but I've always been so sad that they do still rely on the crutch of dice roll to resolve, which to me is, it's literally weak sauce. Um, I, I think there, we have come so far in board game development that just saying, hey, after I make all my plans and we got it, okay, now just roll the dice and see if the dice let me do what I want to do. Not interested. So as much as I've respected all their designs, I've covered a few of them, they've always been passes for me and Jed because of the dice. And so, when I saw their next game coming, I'm like, oh, it's probably going to be more of the same. But then, I look down here, and um, it doesn't say anything about dice rolling mechanisms. And there is a picture of the board, and there's no dice anywhere here. There's no dice at all shown in the image of the game set up. And so, folks... While it does, in fact, say that there are dice, um, there's no real talk about it in the description. And so, my hope, my fervent, deep, deep desire is that Adam and Brady have finally decided to abandon Roll to Resolve. If they have, 
this will probably go into my top 10 most anticipated. If they haven't, it will go off the list entirely. And so since it, the outcome is unknown, but I am cautiously optimistic, I'm keeping it right here in the middle of the list, Hour of Need, uh, I'm sure it'll be a really great cooperative superhero adventure game. I'm sure the gameplay will be solid, uh, really cool, fun, combo-tastic stuff. Fingers crossed, they have, for this brand new exciting decade, they have decided to um, enter undiscovered country from a design perspective for them and uh, come up with a way to resolve combat other than just rolling dice and crossing your fingers. I'm certainly crossing my fingers for our in need. But now, let's move on to the Lions of Lydia. One reason and one reason only this is on the list. It's all I need. Johnny Pack Canton, or Johnny Pack, as he is also known. He had such an amazing year in 2019. Three stellar games coming out. Sierra West, um, Fistful of Meeples, and one of my top ten games of the year, Coloma. And right out of the gate, he is following that up with Lions of Lydia, which is apparently it's a bag-building game. A bag building engine builder. Yay, I like those kind of things. And I love this setting um, having to do with the dawn of currency in the ancient world. That is a very intriguing idea. There could be so much stuff. You know, humanity, society, switching away for, from straight barter systems into a monetary system. I, I can imagine lots of ways that that would work its way into the design, and I can't wait to see what he did. Honestly, I don't need to read the rest of this description. You can pause and read it yourself if you want, if you're watching this in video form, because it occurs to me now, I'll also have this in the uh, podcast. So sorry, f folks are only hearing this in the podcast. Uh, but suffice to say, Johnny Pack is doing a bag builder about the dawn of currency in society, and... Uh, yeah, the guy is on fire after last year. I cannot wait to see what he comes up with. So that is the Lions of Lydia. And then moving right along, we've got Rocket Men, which immediately puts Rocket Man in my head. That's probably the only thing I'm going to have to complain about is that it will just hardwire my brain and dr drill that earworm in there. But at least it's a good one. I mean, who doesn't love Rocket Man? Uh, um, I'm not going to start singing it, though. Uh, I don't want a YouTube strike against me. But... Martin Wallace is back doing Euroy goodness. I think Martin Wallace is certainly one of, deservedly known as one of the greatest designer of modern board games there is. Uh, the man is just a genius. And while it is heartbreaking for me that so many of his designs really don't work for me in Gen, because he loves a bit of the old ultraviolence, a little bit of players just trying to rip each other to shreds, occasionally he will give us a bit of wonder like London or uh, Railways of the World, um, which is just a wonderful game where players are just not trying to tear each other down, but just push themselves forward towards victory. And so, this is one of those games, so I'm excited. But that's not all that I'm excited about. This is a deck builder. And his previous deck builders, which unfortunately were... Um, oh, I can't think of the names of them now. Uh, they're, 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 it, was, it was... Oh, man. This is driving me nuts. He's done two deck builders in the past that were brilliant, but they were both uh, area control, skirmishy warfare battle type things. He's taking that out, just focusing on the deck building now. Hooray! And he is telling the story of today's modern space race. Uh, I am... Don't get me wrong. I love all the games we've been having over the last few years that are talk about, you know, the golden age of space exploration. You know, the the USSR and the USA racing back in the 50s and 60s. That's wonderful, fertile ground. But I have to admit, I am much more interested in what's happening today. So I'm very excited to see a space game that is about the uh, exploits and advancements that are made today. But all of that aside... Actually, I got to talk with Martin a few weeks ago when I saw him at Dice Tower Con in November. He was there, and he was demoing a lot of his upcoming games, including this one. So I got to see it firsthand. And what makes me most excited about it is his approach towards deck building, because Dominion has described the uh, the standard structure of a deck builder is you build up more and more cards of the deck, and you always have to make tough choices about putting scoring cards in that will clog up your deck and action cards in and trying to find the right balance. In this game, you are filling your deck up with cards, but throughout the game, you are pulling these uh, cards out of your deck to put them on deck to uh, basically represent research and preparation for the space missions you're going to launch. And so you are constantly 
at once, building up and tearing apart your deck non-stop, thinning your deck out by preparing projects so you can get to other stuff that you need to drive you to get other things, and eventually, when a project launches, all those cards you had set aside go back in your deck. So your deck has this roller coaster ride that it goes through that I think is very, very exciting. A really fresh new idea for deck building from Mr. Wallace. And so, Rocket Men, I am obviously very, very very excited about this one. And hopefully he works space elevators in, because when I talked to him, he hadn't put that in yet, and he saw, well, or no, not space elevators, the uh, space gyroscope. Oh, anyway, sorry, that's neither here nor there. I'm excited about Rocket Men, but I'm even more excited about artificial intelligence. And this is from Sentiero and Soledad, uh, Nuno and Paolo, and these guys made such a splash years ago when they came out with Panamax, and then right afterwards, they followed that up with Madeira. And they've done a few other games uh, over the ensuing years as well, but they have so thoroughly established themselves as, you know, top of the heap, brilliant designer of crazy, heavy, complex, crunchy Euro goodness, strongly driven by theme, really bringing stories to life, and, uh, you know, creating wonderful stuff. And they are working again with What's Your Game, which as a publisher, has established themselves as the premier heavy Euro publisher on the market. Don't go wrong, they definitely have competition, but you know the combination of their design, uh, you know, editorial chops plus their production values really puts what's your game at the top of their game. And so everybody getting, it's like the band getting back together to make a new super heavy Euro about an incredibly exciting subject. Um, you know, certainly very appropriate considering the new decade we're moving into artificial intelligence and the upcoming technological singularity where AI truly breaks through and becomes smarter than us. And as some people fear, we end up with a Skynet situation. But as this game proposes and the uh, what I tend to think of more, we move closer and closer to our Star Trek future of, you know, complete and total... Um, Oh, what do you call the the lack of resource scarcity and a bright and bold future where uh, well, actually I love how they said it where the AI solves the problems we didn't even knew we had. So this is a game about the early days of that and the corporations that are trying to profit off of this because you know at the moment the technology we won't have given up our old ways we won't quite have that uh, post scarcity Star Trek utopia but this game tells the story of how we get there set in the year 2090 from a uh, you know one of the best design duos in the industry from one of the best publishers in the industry artificial intelligence this has been coming for a long time fingers crossed this is the year we finally get to play AI alrighty then we move on to quantified. This, again, talk about a timely game subject matter. This is a game uh, that casts players uh, in a just the day after tomorrow society, or in some places in the world, you could argue, in the society in certain places in the world today. Why is that? Because in this world, we live in a society where all of our daily lives are 100% monitored by the government. And based on what we do, we get social rankings that give us access to different levels of what society has to offer us. Sound familiar to anybody? Yes, this is happening in the world today. And Quantified is a game that takes a long, hard look at the impact of this to society. Just that right there. Uh, makes me want to play this game because this is a game that has something to say about our world. As we move in to a bold new decade where this is going to become more commonplace unless society rejects it, um, and right now, we are showing no signs of rejecting this. We have new generations of you know, Gen Zers and uh, Millennials that have grown up with uh, you know their every move monitored because they broadcast them on Facebook. So, is this our future? I don't know, but I'm excited to try this game to explore what this future means. Because interestingly, this is a cooperative game where all players are trying to ensure that um, every facet of humanity, every strata layer in society benefits in this new 
utopia of sorts. Um, because by default, things tend to uh, go better for people who are in better situations. And, you know, the immigrants, the uh, lower on the uh, on the totem pole, they tend not to get to share. And so, cooperatively, what we're doing in this game is trying to pull everybody up. And be a little subversive at the same time, because a lot of the actions we can do, well, they don't fit with the government's idea of what is a perfect modeled society. And as we do what we need to do to help everybody, that can knock us down lower into the social strata. These are very, very cool ideas that I am personally very, very interested in as a subject matter. And I love the idea of a board game allowing us to explore them. And that's why Quantified makes the list. But Quantified is not alone because after that, we've got Inner Compass. This is not a game uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, nanny state, totalitarian, utopia, whatever you want to call it. This is not a 1984 game, but this is another game that really digs deep thematically into the real modern world we live in. Because this is a game from, actually, from a really great design duo, uh, uh, Daniel Peterson and Oscar Granerud, who had a great year last year with Bloomtown and... Oh, this is going to drive me nuts. They had like three really solid games. And the only one I can think of is Bloomtown at the moment. But hey, you can go look them up. Uh, I covered them all, I believe. But anyway, they had a great year last year. And this is a really good start because this is a game that, to be honest, is kind of abstract-ish. Uh, but what it does is it explores or it lets you take the role of players trying to find emotional balance in their lives uh, and uh, you know and, and, and finding out who they are and you know riding the roller coaster of their emotional highs and lows all through a basically an abstract strategy card drafting uh, game. And I love this. There was a game a few years ago from a friend of mine and a friend of his put out called And Then We Held Hands, which was another abstract game uh, which was uh, about players trying to work together through to, to maintain a relationship, going through rocky times. And every, most everything was abstracted out. It was really just most about emotional communication and fidelity. It seems like that's what this game is as well. As it declares, it is a bold experiment in determining your personal inner compass. I don't know how well, I don't know if that's just marketing speak and it lets you, it gives you an insight into yourself. Because I have to admit, I haven't actually looked at how this game works at all. Uh, but it says it's an abstract game. Looking at the game, it looks like it's a bunch of colors that probably represent different emotional states. I know there's set collection and I think there's card drafting and whatnot. Long story short, you had me at Oscar and Daniel. Then you had me again at you know emotional exploration of uh, you know of what it means to be human. Cool, cool stuff coming. Oddly enough, from uh, Alderac Entertainment, AEG. They're really known more for their um, you know Thunderstony type stuff. So this is a really big departure for them, which makes it even more interesting to me. It must be great for them to. Um, abandon their normal bread and butter and try such a far out exper experimental theme of game. Hence, my incredible enthusiasm for Inner Compass. Alrighty, moving right along, we've got, ah, we're down to the top 10, folks. Um, my number 10 is The School of Sorcery. And if you're actually looking at the video, you can see I've actually given this 10 stars. I'm not saying this is a 10-star game. I haven't actually played it. I just used that. I'll have, to, I'll have to get rid of this afterwards. I just used that to remember when I hit number 10 on the list. I'm in my top 10, everybody. And number 10, School of Sorcery from Steve Finn. If you're a longtime fan of my show, you know I am a longtime fan of Steve Finn, the king of the filler. He is just quietly doing his own little design production house, Dr. Finn Games. And the thing about School of Sorcery is, this is revisiting, uh, maybe, certainly his greatest game that he himself has published. Uh, arguably, Biblios is still the top of the heap, but that was, you know, he published that through others. And, but the Institute of Magical Arts is such a wonderful two-player dueling area control game, which might sound like the antithesis of what my wife Jen and I would enjoy, but it's a testament to how amazing Institute for Magical Arts is that we love it. 
And so Steve is revisiting it, giving it a slight retheme, School of Sorcery. And I don't really know what is changing. Quite frankly, nothing has to change. I just hope more people get to experience the wonderful gameplay of this game, because it's just phenomenal. If you want to know why, you can go back and watch the run-through I did years ago. Um, but uh, I, I'm just thinking about playing it with Jen. just puts a smile on my face. We've had so much fun with it. I am kind of bummed, because... Really, Institute for Magical Arts so deserves to be rethemed with the Harry Potter theme and just become one of the biggest games in the universe because it's so good. Obviously, that's not happening, but hey, I'm just happy more people will get to play via School of Sorcery, my number 10 most anticipated game of the year. And now, moving on to number 9, we have Cosmic Colonies. Now, this is one of several Kickstarter games I covered last year, and I covered a whole bunch, and I'll revisit most of them when I do the podcast, but there were a few of the Kickstarter games. I mean, they were all good games. They were all fun, but there were a few that really spoke to me and Jen that we loved so much, and I'm going to talk about them right now, starting with number nine, Cosmic Colonies. This is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is maybe Scott Alm's greatest design to date. And he has designed dozens of games that people love to pieces. Um, but Cosmic Colonies is him just working on another level. In a, in a nutshell, it is a card drafting game crossed with a polyomino tile laying style game. You can watch my run through to see how it plays, but it does so many brilliant things. The coolest thing about this, unlike most card drafting games that borrow from Seven Wonders or Sushi Go, the idea of, oh, I've got a bunch of cards. I'll play one and then give you the rest. In this game, I will play, actually every round you play two of them, and then I'll hold on to the ones I didn't play and give you the ones I played. And if I played those, those must have been the best. And if I play those, I know I'm giving them to you. And if you see me play those, you know those cards are coming to you in the future. This is so brilliant. It so turns card drafting on its head. I can't imagine why. Maybe it has come sooner. I just never saw it. But it's brilliant in Cosmic Colonies. And then, if all that weren't enough, the polyomino tiling, Tetrisy type stuff of building a colony on, a, uh, on an asteroid, a mining colony, is brilliant as well. Either one of these games would have been amazing on their own. Combining the two of them together, mwah! It's my number nine most anticipated game, Cosmic Colonies. Then we've got number eight, Calico. Oh, wow, this just came out of nowhere and blew us away when I covered it on Kickstarter last year. And by the way, I guess it's, I, it, I, I probably should say for these two games, these were paid previews. I was paid to cover them, but you know what? That's... That's last decade. Now, um, I don't think you have to worry about because I'm just talking about what I personally am super duper stoked excited about. I loved all of the games that we played on Kickstarter, although a lot of them just didn't weren't really good fits for me and Jen. And I always explained why, uh, even when I was paid. But Calico blew us away. If it had come out last year, it would have made my top 10 of the year. Uh, and so it's an early odds on favorite for top 10 of 2020. And what is it? It's a super simple tile laying, tile drafting game where players are trying to make quilts and make adorable kittens happy. And that may sound really sweet and saccharine and gateway family friendly ish, but don't be fooled. This game is devious just how deep and crunchy it is. One of the best tile laying puzzles I ever played. Loved it to pieces. Cannot wait uh, to get a final retail instead of the prototype we played. My number eight, and I know that because I've, I've given it eight stars. Again, after I'm done, I'll have to mark that out because I haven't really played the final thing. But my number eight, Calico. Then we go on to number seven, Sleeping Gods, which I also covered on, um, on a Kickstarter last year. A lot of people consider Near and Far to be Ryan Lockett's masterpiece, and with good reason. I think when Sleeping Gods come out, it might supplant it. Uh, because this is an epic game of exploration and adventure. Kind of almost feels like, remember Land of the Lost? The Saturday morning show from the 60s where a family got uh, thrown into this crazy kind of alternate dimension where time, or it seemed out of time and there were just weird uh, mixes of stuff. That's the world you find yourself in as you're trying to get back home. You're all the crew of a ship. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. You deal with all kinds of stuff. It's a big old storybook and a separate book for a map book. And it is just full of greatness. And as much as Jen and I were impressed when we played it originally in prototype form, I talked with 
with Ryan at Board Game Geek Con uh, last year, and he showed me he has made significant changes to the game, uh, including adding a whole new worker placement element that was not there when I did my run through. So. I'm as excited as anybody to try it out again and see how he has evolved the formula moving forward. Because like I said, I think this is going to eclipse near and far, which is really saying something because that was already a brilliant game. And folks, it's cooperative. It's Ryan's first really big push. He's done a little bit of cooperative stuff here and there, but this is all cooperative and it's great to see him grow as a designer and try new things. So, uh, Sleeping Gods, my number seven most anticipated game of the year. Then let's move on to number six. Uh, Mercado de Lisboa. And hey, everybody. It's everybody's favorite Euro designer, Vita Lasarda. Oh, man. Uh, Vital is... Now, actually, everything I said earlier uh, about uh, Nuno and Paulo, uh, when I was talking about AI, about how you know they are the cream of the crop, the top of the hill in terms of really rich, thematic, crunchy Euros... Everything I said about them goes equally or even more so for Vita Lasarda, who is the true king of the crunchy, heavy, uh, thematic, uh, but incredibly elegant and yet incredibly complex at the same time, Euro. And this is going to be his new game coming this year. And interestingly, he's got a co-designer, which I assume means that really Mercado is the design of Julian Pombo and um, Vital is helping out. But I don't know that. I don't have any inside information. What's more interesting to me is this is billed as a thinky filler. So, this is not going to be the next Kanban or Lisboa or Vinos. Big, crazy, heavy, epic, multi-hour games that just make our brains melt down. I'm really looking forward. I am hoping for something that is big and epic and heavy and makes our brain melt down, but that we get done in 15 to 30 minutes. That sounds awesome to me. So I cannot wait to see what these guys have come together. So much so that it is my number six, Mercado de Lisboa. Then we move on to number five, Perseverance, the Castaway Chronicles. I've been waiting for this one for years. This is the next big, big, super explosion board game experience from Mind Clash Games. And they have set themselves up as the premier chrome-filled Euro publisher in the industry because they, in their designs, well, they do phenomenal uh, presentation and components and all that, but they don't just go overboard with the production values. They always go overboard with the actual design themselves and just layer in mechanism after mechanism after mechanism. And they always end up producing amazing stuff like Anachrony or Trickerian. Um, I, I didn't play the, more, the most recent one because it had too much player versus player uh, for our taste, so that was kind of a bummer, but I am definitely interested in their next one coming this year, Perseverance, because here's the setting, folks. This could be this is another game that has kind of a Land of the Lost type feel, where in this game, an entire luxury liner of uh, tourists ends up washed up on this uh, island that time forgot, where there's still dinosaurs running around. And the, this game takes place over multiple generations. Uh, because these people, once they're shipwrecked, they are never going to escape this island. And so, they uh, grow up. Their kids grow up. Their kids' kids grow up. And they have to build an entirely new civilization in a harsh and unforgiving landscape. That's awesome. I am very intrigued by that subject matter. I mean, talk about something that we, as regular modern board game fans, can really project ourselves into. This is definitely something you can imagine. Well, what would it be like if I found myself in this circumstance? Um, you know, this crazy far out thing. So, I'm really intrigued by the concept. I'm very enthusiastic about the publisher and the designers. Um, you know, oh, oh, actually, yeah, uh, Thomas Van Ginst. And, uh, you know, Victor, and I think Dave Turchi is in it again. Uh, let's see. And I don't know where that opened. But anyway, so there's a bunch of designers. I'm not quite sure why. Opening full mode. I'll probably open a different window. Whatevs. So, this is very exciting. I love the subject matter. The art looks like it's got really great presentation. I cannot wait to see what Mind Clash comes up again. That is Perseverance, the Castaway Chronicles. Then we move on to number four. Dice Realms. This is from Tom Lehman. And while... Uh, Res Arcana, Res Arcana did not make my personal top 10 of 2019. 
I could certainly make an argument that it was the best game to come out in 2019 in an objective sense, evaluating the core mechanisms and what that game was able to accomplish with very minimalist approach to design. I was so floored by what Tom created there. And so uh, he's done an expansion for it, you know, whatevs. What's moving on forward is this year he's going to be doing something completely different, Dice Realms. And this is interesting because this is going to be the latest game that uh, introduces the idea of customizable dice over the course of the game. You pop dice faces out and smash new ones onto there so your dice grow and evolve over the course of the game. And I saw an interview where Tom talked about how he worked with dice dra or dice building a little bit with the expansion for Roll Through the Galaxy. And he was so intrigued by it, he wanted to make an entire game. And so what he's done is it looks to me almost like he's revisiting some of the ideas of Favor of the Pharaoh. Um, um, but introducing dice drafting. And the interesting thing is, apparently, this game ha comes with 650 die faces uh, across 72 different categories of die faces, three custom trays to hold them all, uh, all kinds of stuff. This is probably going to be the biggest, most ambitious dice crafting game that has ever come out. And there have been some really cool ones. You know, uh, was it uh, not Dice Throne? Uh, oh, I can't think of it. But they're, uh, yeah. Uh, is it? No, Dice Forge, up till now, has been my favorite of them. Uh, and I really like the dice crafting that Tom did. But I cannot wait for this. Uh, because, again, Raise Arcana was amazing. Our only problem with it, with it was that there was too much player... Not necessarily messing with each other, but creating threat of messing with each other. There was always just too much of the threat of player violence in that game for our taste. Fingers crossed... This is a little bit more live and let live. I'm making my dice realm. You're making your dice realm. We just keep our people happy and um, successful as we get 650 die faces we can snap into our customized dice. That's crazy. That is very exciting, very ambitious, and it's my number four most anticipated game of the year, Dice Realms. Then we move on to number three, more dice with Twa Dice. Now, um, Twa is still, or Troyes, if... Uh, if you prefer the more common way to pronounce it instead of the Frenchy sort of way to do it. Although apparently even it's supposed to, you're supposed to hear the R when you say toi, but I can't do it. Uh, I just I cannot hear the French R in my uh, when people say it properly. But anyway, long story short, toi is in my top ten favorite games of all time. Uh, the heir apparent to toi, Black Angel came out last year and it made it in my top ten of the year. So I love toi. Now here's the interesting thing. Uh, Twa Dice was actually released at a convention, I think, two years ago as a little promo giveaway roll and write game. And, um, you know, so only people who went to this one particular convention got it, but it spread like wildfire and people photocopied and, and you know, it was entered on a board game geek and people started downloading and making their own. And, uh, you know, people were really excited about it. But, um, you know, the designer publisher said, wait, 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 no, we, we fully plan on on making this a shipping game. Please stop doing that, everybody. We would like to charge you money for it for a high quality, full production. You know, that was just kind of testing the waters. And so, Twa Dice, as, as quickly as it popped up, it disappeared. And we're finally getting, it's finally resurfacing now in 2020 as a full big box. I think this is still a roll and write, isn't it? Uh, yep, it is a roll and write. And, uh, yeah. I love Twa. Twa is one of the greatest dice drafting games of all time. As I said earlier, dice drafting is my favorite gameplay mechanism of all time. So fingers crossed, uh, crossed, I'm getting Twa, uh, fingers crossed that this will live up to the pedigree of what has come before. I cannot wait to find out my number three most anticipated game, Twa Dice. Um, but we're almost done, folks. And next one, this is the craziest one on the list, potentially. And it's going to come out of nowhere for most people. My number two most anticipated game of the year is Adventure Inc. The Five Factions of Filigree. And here is the deal. This is an adventure roll-and-write game. I mentioned a few times, I really like roll-and-write games. And um, full disclosure... This game is being designed uh, and developed and ultimately published by a friend of mine uh, in real life. 
And here's why I'm so excited. Well, one, I'm excited that one of my friends gets to publish a game he's been working on for years. That, and it's, of course, anybody would be excited about that. But here's the real reason I'm interested in Adventure Inc. Aside from the fact that I love fantasy, um, adventure, cooperative stuff, and I love Roll and Write, and I love the idea of melding those ideas together. Um, you know, I, that's all really great too. But here's the thing. Uh, Andrew, my friend, has been working on this for I don't know how many years now. And in all this time, at least monthly and often weekly, he will call me up and say, Hey, I want to throw this idea by you. Um, and at first I was like, okay, I, 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 you know, he knows I know a lot about games. I play a lot of games. He's always asked me, have you ever played a game like this? Because I really like this idea and this and that and the other. And it started out that way. But at some point over the many, many months where he kept asking me for feedback on the mechanisms and ideas and whatnot, at one point he eventually told me, you know, I'm designing this game for you and Jen, right? I'm like, whoa. So, obviously, Adventure Inc. is, um, well... I'm a little embarrassed it's not my number one most anticipated game, but we'll get to my number one in a minute. I am so excited about it because I know a lot of what is going into this game. A lot of the design of this game came out of this brain. This game is probably the closest I will ever get to the rest of my life or for the rest of my life, to actually designing a game. Because for those of you who don't know, I was a professional video game designer for almost two decades. Um, and... I don't design games anymore. I, I'm very burned out, and uh, people are always saying, when are you going to design a uh, board game? I'm not going to do it. But Adventure Inc., you could consider that. Um, you know, He's asked, and I've always said, no, 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 I, I don't need co-design credits or anything like that. I'm just more than happy to help him out because he is a, a, a close personal friend of mine. I love the guy. And all of that aside, there is so much amazing content in this game because you might think, oh, it's an adventure roll and write. That means it's just a simple little trifle like most roll and writes. He set out from the get-go to make a roll and write that is deep and as rich as Gloomhaven with so much stuff, you know, a kitchen sink kind of design. And, you know, he's always throwing more ideas in and he's always asking me, I really should pair this back, shouldn't I? And I just keep saying... Did uh, Isaac Childress pair it back on, um, you know, on uh, Gloomhaven? Do the guys at Mind Clash pair it back when they make their big games? So, if he sticks to his guns, and I haven't seen the final, he's still working on it. He's probably working on it right now because he's just been obsessed with it. Uh, well, this could be the greatest game of all time uh, because it's been scientifically designed to scratch every itch Jen and I have ever had. So, obviously... Obviously, I am very, very excited about Adventure Inc. The Five Factions of Filigree. Which, by the way, uh, the game is actually called Adventure Inc. The Five Factions of Filigree is intended to be his first uh, adventure module. And then there'd be, because the town is called Filigree, and there's five different factions. And, uh, you know, in future, he might go into different portions of the world because he's making a whole new fantasy world with new creatures and not just uh, retreading. You know, a very uh, gloomhavish in that regard. Uh, anyway, long story short. I could easily do an hour talking about all the specific stuff I know about this game and how it's evolved over the last couple of years. But all I'll say right now is fingers crossed. I know he's hoping on getting this on Kickstarter later in the year. And actually early in the year, he's going to be putting out another game he's been talking about and working on for several years called Plunderous. And actually Plunderous looks really cool too. But you know what? I'm going to talk about that on the podcast because uh, it, you know, he hasn't designed that one specifically for me and Jen. But... I've had a lot of say in that one also because I've given him a lot of feedback and there's a lot of really cool ideas. So come back in the podcast and you'll hear about his other game. Uh, and depending on how well Plunderous does, uh, we'll determine whether he could then, you know, get that thing fulfilled and then move on to Adventure Inc. Fingers crossed he does because it could be the greatest game of all time for my taste. But anyway, uh, still, even though that's number two, that leaves us with one more game to go. What could possibly beat a game that a smart designer has designed specifically to scratch all my itches? Well, there's one itch that uh, Andy is not scratching here, uh, but, but the uh, my number one does. My City. Um, oh, it's, and it's not that it's a city building game. Of course, I love city building games. That's all fine and dandy. It's not that this is a Reiner Knizia design, although I tend to really love, or at the very least, admire and respect Reiner Knizia designs. It is the fact that this is a legacy game. 
And hey, where have all the Legacy games been? Uh, we had some good stuff last year, and it looks like, at this point anyway, uh, My City is pretty much the only one on this list of 25 games that is a straight-up Legacy. What is it? You will play through 24 game levels and make permanent, uh, you know, changes to the world and all that stuff. There's no description here at all. It's a competitive legacy game in which you develop your own city uh, through the ages. Over 24 game levels, you experience challenges again and again. That's the entire description. But you know what? You had me at Reiner Knizia making a city-building legacy-style title. I couldn't not put that in the number one spot because I love games that have me make permanent, never-changing uh, building legacies in games. I love it to pieces. And Reiner Knizia has never done anything like this. And he tends, when he, the first time he ever did a deck builder, it's very different than all the other deck builders out there. He tends, when he approaches new things, to come at them from a different point of view. And so I'm very excited about what his take on Legacy is. Because we've already had Legacy City. We had Charterstone and we had um, Queensdale. So, this is the third one. And uh, what will he do that the other games didn't do? I don't know, but I can't wait to find out. Which is why My City is my number one most anticipated game of the year. And that's it, folks. Phew, how long has this been? 53 minutes to go through 25 excited games. But like I said, that's just the start. I am exhausted now. I'm just going to finish this and upload it and uh, wish everybody one more time, well, uh, Happy New Year. And uh, we'll see you uh, next month, as I will continue hopefully running through a few of these games. Fingers crossed. And that's it, everybody. Thanks, as always, for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.